All right, 501. So we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jack Hall, and I uh, am in the 10th year as head of school here at the Walker School, and uh, am joined tonight by the primary school division head, the head of our New Avenues Dyslexia Program, the head of our lower school, the head of our middle school, the head of our upper school, uh, and you'll be able to hear from them uh, a little later. Uh, and we encourage you, uh, as I share some thoughts about the value of a Walker education, if you have questions, feel free to go into the chat room and put in questions in there and we'll make sure that we monitor those and then we'll answer those uh, later in the segment. So thank you for joining us tonight and um, we'll go ahead and get started. So growing up in a family of four boys, none of whom attended the same school, even though we were always in Atlanta, and as an educator who served in several really fine independent schools here in the metro Atlanta area, I always encourage parents to consider your options. I think it's smart to look at a variety of schools to find the best fit for your child and your family. That's the way we look at college uh, admissions. On the other end, we're looking for the best fit. And I'm confident that when you look carefully at Walker, you're, you will be impressed with our commitment to our mission and our core values, the educational opportunities that are available here and the experience we are able to provide. And today we're gonna to speak to the value of a Walker education. Our first core value says a great deal about who we are. At Walker, we believe in the infinite worth and dignity of the individual. Knowing students goes way beyond just knowing their names. We actually know Bennett's favorite dinosaur, Lily's favorite professor at Hogwarts, and that Jackson is both nervous and excited about tomorrow's basketball game against Lassiter. And when students feel known, they are willing to share what they know and the questions they have and be more inclined to pursue what they don't know yet. And that's something we love here is that we say that they don't know it yet. And as a direct result of our classes being intimately scaled, engagement is the norm and every voice is heard and valued. Each student is guided from early childhood through an increasingly challenging and exciting curriculum that prepares them for college and beyond college. Our second core value is likely one of the attributes that attracted you to Walker in the first place. We believe that student learning is the chief priority of the school. That is also what helps us attract such experienced, qualified teachers. Teachers who want to teach in a school where kids want to learn and where their parents want them to learn. We're really intentional at Walker about our efforts to make thinking visible. You know, in the pre-pandemic era, when you could visit campus, you would hear teachers say, what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? And the intersection of the first core value and the second core value really results in differentiated learning for each and every student. A simple game of chop it as a warm up to kindergarten math rotations helps our students understand addition, subtraction, greater than, less than, and anchoring to 10. And I know you're like, what is he talking about? Each student has their own set of 10 cubes and they chop it and then they guess how many are behind their classmates back. So if I show you this, if you can see how many cubes there are, four, then when you solve for X behind my back, you know, that the number is six. And so our, and this is happening in kindergarten, you know, so our kids are solving for X in really fun ways and they're engaging in interesting conversations about math. And when you think about it, this allows students to go beyond memorization and regurgitation of facts. It builds stronger sense and deeper understanding of putting numbers together and taking them apart. And down the line, when they start talking about fractions and they talk about one tenth, they're like, oh yeah, I know what one tenth is. 
So it's differentiated and it's individualized. Now, when, when considering the value of a Walker experience, you shouldn't just take my word for it. Um, it's important for you to hear from our stakeholders, from our students and our parents. Listen to this letter from the father of a current senior who was writing about his daughter's journey at Walker just this past spring. He wrote, Walker's obviously a great school, but there came a day when I stopped considering the annual tuition check as an expense and I started considering it an investment. That was the day I attended parents night when Rhodes was in first grade. I was enthralled with both teachers and the magical way they discussed their class and their students. And Rhodes would come home daily and share some magical experience that she had at school. I was sold then and remain so to this day. I know nothing about the details associated with creating a great school, but it was just clear to me that great teachers had been turned loose to educate my child. At the heart of our mission is the phrase, meaningful relationships inspire transformative learning. Just another way of saying that great teachers have been turned loose to educate your child. And, and you hear from a parent, now hear from a student. Here, here's an email that one of our seniors wrote this fall to our science department chair, Emily Adams. Hi, Ms. Adams. I just wanted to reach out and let you know that because of you, I have decided to declare a public health major with the intention of going into the field of epidemiology. I really appreciate everything you did for me when I was a freshman in your bio class and then in your epi class during my junior year. Your passion for the subject inspired me to pursue a career in the field. Thank you so much for everything. And I hope you're having a great year, Maddie. And at Walker, Maddie isn't just a science kid. In fact, I was actually kind of surprised when I saw that letter. She's the field director for our Wolverine attack band. She plays the parent, the clarinet. She's in the, the pit for all of our uh, high school musicals because uh, our, our orchestra pit is student run and student led. And she's a dedicated and talented swimmer. Emily Adams, who teaches a guided research class, is the faculty sponsor for our summer internship at the CDC. Walker is one of two schools in Georgia that have students participating in internships at the CDC. And just think how important that's been this year. I believe there's also an interesting data point that demonstrates the trust that our faculty build with our students. It comes from the challenge index, which is a national measurement comparing schools based on how many advanced placement or international baccalaureate exams their students take compared to the size of their senior class. And you can find this on the internet. It's actually called the J. Matthews Challenge Index, used to be with the Washington Post. Walker students, uh, Walker upper school students took six times the number of AP exams last spring as the number of graduating seniors that we had, which is more than any other school in Cobb County and is actually third overall in the entire state of Georgia. Why is it that Walker students take twice as many AP tests as students at our nearby public and private schools. Part of it is certainly that we create an intellectual community where in fact, it is cool to be smart. Part of it's also that we offer 26 advanced placement courses across all subject areas. But the most important reason that the students are most likely to succeed and take on challenge in an is, is because they're in an environment where they're supported, encouraged and known by their teachers. An environment where teachers can give frequent, meaningful feedback on students' writing. An environment where students are comfortable asking questions and know that teachers are available for extra help. An environment where there is a multi-variable calculus class for 10 students that's taught on our campus by a Walker expert faculty member instead of having to be taken as a distance learning class from a college. I encourage you to read Walker's promise statement. If you go on the website on the about page, you'll see our promise and you click on that and you can read the, the promise statement. 
because there's there's several key phrases in that promise that we offer to families that embody the Walker experience. And I'd like to highlight several of those for you. One is Walker students feeling known and encouraged by their teachers and classmates come to value the experience over the applause. We encourage every child to stay open to all of the possibilities on our campus. Such a culture finds the varsity basketball player deciding to try out for the musical because he thinks it'll be cool to learn to dance and sing on stage. His basketball coach and the theater director get together to work out a schedule that allows him to play and to rehearse. This letter was written by a member of the class of 2019 on the eve of his departure for uh, as a freshman at an Ivy League college where he's majoring in government and playing football. And I think it captures this sense of valuing the experience over the applause. He writes, I am forever grateful for the last seven years I spent at Walker, surrounded by teachers who not only sought me to teach, so I'm, I'm sorry, who not only sought to teach me, but also helped me to grow as a person. As you know, my Walker experience encapsulated so much more than the normal 8 to 315 school day. And that's another thing I'm so grateful for opportunity. I was able to play 21 consecutive seasons of sports. And admittedly, I excelled on some teams and played a supporting role in others. But I had the chance to be out there learning in a different way while also making lifelong friends. When I look back at those opportunities I took part in, it just brings me absolute joy. The time I spent with my teammates playing for my school is the greatest thing of all. The promise statement also says that Walker teachers cultivate a spirit of wanting to know in our students. Perhaps the best way to articulate this is to share more parent feedback. Earlier this fall, an upper school mom wrote to all of her daughter's junior teachers or junior daughter's teachers. I just wanted to take a minute to let you know how much you are all appreciated. Rosemary has been so excited to start school and she talks about each of you every day. We've heard about DNA extraction to feminist views and literature to a certain beloved advisor singing and dancing to Frozen. I've seen pre-calculus videos made to explain hard concepts and have heard, mom, you would love Miss Martello. She's so organized and on top of things. I see the daily emails with the extensive planning and engaging lessons that you are integrating into your classes. It is not going unseen or unappreciated. Third, the promise statement shares that our students will be known and encouraged. Just this past week, we celebrated senior day for our varsity girls basketball team. And as we did that, Coach Barnett asked the underclassmen to write a note about each senior on the team. She read the notes before the game because relationships matter. Those relationships forge through any group endeavor, on a court, on the field, on the stage, on a project, are a huge part of the Walker experience. Our seniors will not soon forget what their teammates said about them in the privacy of their locker room before taking the court. And just maybe that's what inspired them to win. And over time, that game, I don't know, but I'm sure they were pretty fired up about it. Our connection with our students also extends beyond graduation. Each year, we send care packages to our freshmen at college. And after receiving a care package earlier this fall, uh, one parent wrote to say thank you. Maggie shared your letter with us. Thank you for taking the time to write and encourage her. It's been such a joy to parent her, and I'm really going to miss her smile and her enthusiasm for just about everything. Walker was a great fit for Maggie in so many ways, and we know that she's very well prepared for college. We also have no doubt that Walker helped her get into the honors program and receive generous scholarships. We are so grateful for the relationships that she is, has with her teachers and her coaches. Coach Eisenman took time to get to know her 
And that really built her confidence and helped her achieve success out on the track and field. Mr. Mo, our band director, believed in her and gave her the opportunity to lead something she loves to do. She had so many fulfilling opportunities, not just to pursue music and track, but to excel in ways I don't think she would have had the opportunity to do at a larger school. And finally, our promise statement acknowledges that our graduates will have developed the confidence to explore new avenues of thinking as a result of the engaging perspective widening educational experience at Walker. Walker is intentionally sized, intimately scaled, our mission says. We also are challenging and inclusive. And this ensures that your child will be known and valued. They will also be challenged because high expectations make for interesting and interested people. And finally, they will certainly be welcomed. We are inclusive because hearing different voices and hearing dip and, and learning from those who've had other experiences not only helps each child find their own voice, it helps each child honor the view of others. This is how we prepare our students to have full lives and to thrive in a world that is complex and ever-changing. We are truly one walker, and we're excited for you to get to know us better and for us to get to know your children and your families through the admission process. So thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna to turn it over to Michael Arjona, who is the assistant head for academics and also the head of our upper school. And Michael's gonna lead us through question and answers. And so if you have questions, please feel free to put, put them in the chat room. All right, excellent, thank you, Jack. Um, so we're gonna jump into our Q&A um, as uh, we have some, some questions here loaded up, but also uh, keep questions coming you know, as, as we go through. So let's uh, start off, um, you know, Dr. Emily Tyson is our head of our primary school, which is early learners pre-kindergarten. Kindergarten. So uh, we have a parent who wants to know, uh, how do you help children with the social transition into primary school? Oh, thanks, Michael. That's actually, a, that's a really great question. First, before I answer that, kudos to Jack on um, chopping it correctly. Good job. <laughs> Excellent job with your, um, your tens linking cubes. So good job. Um, to help students adjust socially and emotionally in the primary school, we try to create a familiar and a kind environment. Um, some students are running towards their classroom doors and others are very hesitant um, to leave their parents' side. That varies day to day and hour by hour. So we want to make it a familiar environment where they feel very safe. Each classroom begins the day with a morning meeting where the day's plan is reviewed and students have the opportunity to greet one another. They can practice eye contact and active listening skills. From a very, very young age, um, we teach our kids how to treat each other with respect and kindness. Each classroom participates in guidance lessons from our very own primary school counselor, focusing on all the different aspects of social emotional learning. Our early learners emphasize basic social skills such as turn taking, using words to express our feelings and being kind to a friend. Those are huge skills that we work on, not only as an early learner, but also in pre-K and kindergarten. However, once we get our students get to pre-K and kindergarten, we like to transition them to developing more advanced social skills, such as teaching them about empathy and compassion. Sorry, my voice is out. Uh, as you can see, I like to talk. Um, our teachers take a hands-on approach when helping our students develop social skills by intervening as necessary and modeling appropriate kind communication. After all, if you've ever visited the primary school, our building is full of big feelings and very little bodies. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Dr. Tyson. Sure. Uh, so next we have a question for uh, Cindy O'Neill. So Cindy O'Neill is the 
I'm head of our new avenues program, uh, which is our school within a school that offers targeted instruction for students with dyslexia within our lower school. So uh, Cindy, this uh, question from a parent is, um, you know, we just recently received a diagnosis of dyslexia, both relieved and overwhelmed. Can you share a story of what success looks like for a student in your program? Absolutely, Michael. I feel like this is almost what occurs on most tours of the school is parents, it's a journey and it's a new part. And we are so excited to partner with you. Uh, one of the first things we always tell parents is that you know, we are here no matter what. We want to work with you and support you in this because there's a lot to discover. I think for us in New Avenues, to just, as we look at our program and to build it, success is that child gaining an understanding of their individual strengths and how they learn that, you know, it's important to know facts and to learn skills, but more importantly is to know how do I learn best so I can later advocate for myself and journey forward. Uh, of course, we want to nurture a love of reading. We do that with our individualized program. Um, our children break out into smaller groups for reading, and each group focuses on what that group of children need, and we reassess throughout the year so we can adjust as needed. Um, and again, it's confidence. We want children to feel confident as learners, to explore, to know that they can seek information, as well as to advocate. Um, I actually, as I was thinking about this, I received an email, um, and this is perfect because I'd like to share, a parent just sent this to me just on Friday, and it said, um, so I wanted to share a quick story with you. Today, I met with a friend who has a child in his first year in New Avenues. She shared a few sweet stories that literally gave me goosebumps and reminded me of where we were three years ago with our son. This is our son's third year in New Avenues, and to say his progress has been remarkable is an understatement. This morning, we found him in bed reading a newly selected library book before his alarm went off. After his morning routine, he packed the book in his backpack and headed off to school. At afternoon carpool, the book was in his hand waiting for me to pull up. In the car, he promptly opened the book again, and by the time we arrived home, he was done reading it cover to cover. I'm sharing this story to say thank you for all of you helping him find his passion for reading, guiding him to choose books that he truly can't put down, and encouraging him the past three years. In our home, we lovingly refer to all of you in New Avenues and the lower school as part of Team Henry. And Michael, I couldn't have summed it up better. That is, that is a success. That's what we want. Children that want to read and parents that feel supported and know that we're there to, on the journey. Well, that's great. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, so next question, let's uh, have one for about middle school. So for our middle school head, Mr. Ira Dawson, uh, what type of students are a good fit for Walker's Middle School? Oh, that's a good question. We get that a lot from prospective families, especially those looking for students to be successful in middle school. The funny thing about it, though, is that middle school happens during those transformative years. So, you know, Monday, definitely that child would not look the same on Friday. And so what we try to do is, is really hone on those skills that uh, really help that student be successful in the in inside and outside the classroom, especially in the community. Things like what Jack mentioned, which is, you know, students who value the experience more than the applause. You know, students who will have that love for learning and will not so focus on the grade, but the experience they're having with the teacher bonding over a subject that they never thought they would love. You know, we love to have those students who are willing to dive in and try new things, to get their hands dirty, uh, to play an instrument and say, hey, you know, I don't have rhythm, but those drums sound really nice. Let me try that. <laughs> You know, those students who every day wake up and operate with empathy and compassion and look at one another and say, you know what, this hug that I'm about to give you may be the only one that you've received today. And I really want to make you feel better. And so we look for those small things in students, open mindedness, confidence, the ability to communicate with adults, you know, uh, optimism, those who come with that little spunk. But we know there are going to be some days where that may not be the case. And we have an, uh, uh, we do a pretty good job of helping students kind of balance that out. 
What we try to do is draw all those skills that where students say, hey, I'm not a math person or, you know, I don't want to try this or I, I, you know, I've never tried that. I don't really want to. We try to get them to be a little bit more open minded and realize middle school really is the place to make mistakes because you're surrounded with people who really care for you, who love you and will help you no matter what. And so we, we look for a lot of things, but there's no one type of student that we look for, but we look forward to the diversity that we have within the middle school. Excellent, great, thank you, Ira. Um, now shifting to a uh, question for lower school and, and we have uh, you know, lots of good questions coming in, so, so keep them coming. Um, so on our lower school, just as an FY, is uh, first grade through fifth grade. So, and we have our head of lower school, Mrs. Trish Doherty here. So how would you encourage uh, our one child who is a reluctant writer, but loves math, or our other child that loves reading and writing, but thinks that she is not a math person. Thanks, Michael. Well, just as Cindy said, so much of how children view themselves as learners has to do with confidence. As adults, we um, all know that some people prefer one area of study over another. There are people who, you know, believe or know that they are better at some things, their skill set varies. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we don't want children to believe that they aren't capable and we don't want them to pigeonhole themselves, especially at this point in their learning lives. In the lower school, we strive to create an environment where children feel loved and valued and that they feel safe to take risks, a place where they're comfortable trying something new, a place where learning and exploration is encouraged. It's cool to be smart. And SMART does not look the same for everyone. Our teachers build relationships with their, their students. They really get to know them as students and as people. They tr this trust that the teachers build lets them build upon student strengths while supporting areas in need of growth. Each small success leads to greater confidence. We want our children to know that everyone's brain is a bit different and that's a good thing. Some things may be easy for some and harder for others. We help our students to figure out what works best for them and how to advocate for those things that they need to make their learning the best it can be. So lastly, our teachers are enthusiastic about learning. Their excitement is contagious. It's difficult to be a reluctant writer when your teacher is so, so passionate about writing. How can you dislike your math, math when your teacher, whom you absolutely adore, is patient and encouraging and often pretty funny? This is a pretty magical place. All right, excellent. Thank you, Trish. Uh, so I'll, I'll take one that's uh, uh, an upper school focused question. Uh, so this one is, what does a typical freshman schedule look like? And what should a child expect when it comes to homework? So on the first question of what a typical freshman schedule looks like, there is a, a it's a seven period schedule that the student, you know, students take seven classes. Um, and there's a mix of some classes that are standard ninth grade classes, as well as somewhere they have choice. And that's a really intentional thing that we do because we want to scaffold the amount of choice that the students have. There's going to be some like an English nine class that all of our ninth graders are taking or biology others like where they have choice of their electives of computer science and arts. They choose amongst four different languages they could take. Um, and then they also have choice within um, the social studies of taking an early world history course or being able to push into an AP human geography. And it, it's really important that they have a mix of that choice while also not making lots of choices around level and around course because they're also making the transition to high school. We wanna allow them to make that transition to get comfortable before we, allow, before we then build in a whole lot more choice. That then happens their sophomore, junior, senior year. So that by the time they get to the senior year, you know, as we, we like to say, we have 97 seniors this year and every single senior, no two seniors are taking the same set of classes. But that's something we build up to, um, to where really everyone has that personal path. When it comes to the homework question, um, you know, there, I mean, it's, it's not a, a set amount that they have every day. You know, if you ask the students, it probably would be an average of an hour or two um, each day. But a really important feature is that all of our students have within their schedule a study hall. Um, all of our students, 9 through 12, have that. For our ninth graders, 
it's a directed study hall, meaning that there's a teacher who is there with them. It's not just proctoring the study hall, but acting as an academic coach, providing, checking in with them, uh, providing some help on study skills, uh, everything from uh, you know, how to prepare for their first bio test, the Cornell note-taking method, to how to coaching them on how to write an email when they you know, are reaching out to a teacher to set up a time for extra help. So this, a really important part of how involved our students are is that we build time during the day for them to get work done, um, you know, and in that, in that study hall. And it's a, a really, you know, standard part of what we do. All right, so, so now we'll shift into some questions that I think hit a couple of different divisions. Um, so this first one, um, what does diversity look like and feel like at the Walker School? Uh, more importantly, how do you ensure that all students feel included by students and teachers. So um, really I'll let, uh, you know, any of the division heads of as long as I think if Emily and, and, and Trish or Cindy, one of you wanna weigh in from the primary and lower school side, and then Ira and I can, can weigh in from the middle and upper school side. I'll, I'll go, I'll give you a good example of, of what diversity looks like, Walker. Um, so in my advisory, I have someone who, is uh, celebrates Hanukkah, son of one who celebrates, a lot of us who celebrate Christmas, um, some who celebrate a lot during the Festival of Lights, Dvali, and then also someone who really doesn't do the holidays big time. And so uh, we decided, they asked a good question about Kwanzaa. And so one of the students says, hey, I know what Kwanzaa is. And, and they said, okay, tell us more about Kwanzaa. So here they are in a circle, six feet apart, talking about um, Kwanzaa and what it is and how it's a non-religious holiday. So, of course, they pull me into the conversation. They say, hey, Ms. Dawson, can we celebrate Kwanzaa since it's a non-religious holiday and we all want to participate? Next thing I know, they're bringing in fruits. Uh, they're talking about uh, community economics uh, they're talking about things that are a lot of the Kwanzaa principles. And what they did was they took something that was different between all of them and allowed them to come together as one. And, and that's a, a show of how, you know, differences are valued at Walker. And, and, and students want to learn more about each other. They want to learn more about this world. And they want to continue to stretch themselves and try new things. And I think they value that part of one another. And you can see that as they operate within the classroom in the hallways on the athletic fields. Well, thank you. Um, I'll piggyback off what Mr. Dawson said in the primary school. Um, we, we celebrate it all. We celebrate everything in the primary school. I mean, you tried broccoli for the first time, we're celebrating it. <laughs> you celebrate Kwanzaa, Christmas, Diwali, we're celebrating it and we're learning. And that's just kind of how we, we come into each and every day. We have lots of opportunities, although we're not, we're not talking about the economic part of the conversations <laughs> and things like that, but we are um, bringing in our parents. Um, this is a, a little bit of a different year. So typically our parents are coming in and sharing their holiday traditions or just family traditions. It doesn't even have to be centered on a holiday and coming in and teaching our kids and our peer, our teachers and everybody about what makes their family so extra special. This year we have Zooms in with our families are Zooming in. We're making jelly donuts, learning about Hanukkah. All the children are participating um, with dreidels and learning about guilt and, you know, all of those things that um, the kids have to offer to bring to school each and every day. We want every child and family to feel welcome, loved, and we want to learn. We want to learn what, what makes you happy and what you bring to Walker because we are a community and we want to learn about each other. And we, and that kind of plays into our whole learning about respecting each other and showing compassion and learning about each other. And we start that at three years old. And I'd just like to tell one quick story that happened this week that I loved. Um, one of our teachers uh, is Jewish and was sharing her traditions with her students um, that her family celebrates Hanukkah. And, um, then the other night she got a text from a parent and with and attached was a picture of this sweet little girl lighting um, the menorah. And they're a family that's not Jewish. 
but she went home and told her parents that she had learned about this holiday and wanted to participate and wanted to celebrate too, because that's what Miss Walt, Mrs. Walter does. And so it touched that teacher's heart more than you can imagine. And it's just a neat conversation to be able to say that we can share traditions um, and learn from each other. It's one, you know, that's how we're going to make this, this world a better place. Absolutely. And I think that's just to echo of what, you know, some of the other division heads have, have noted is that focus on inclusion. We want to, it's central, the diversity and inclusion piece of it is central to our kids experience and is central to our preparation for their next steps in college and in interacting with, with, you know, everyone in this wider world. Um, you know, and, and the key is that we want our, our students, we want our families to bring their full selves to school each day and to be comfortable in their full selves and to learn from each other. Um, and, you know, we, we do a lot of work on the upper school side with things around discourse, about listening to each other, about asking questions, about being curious with each other, um, you know, and, and that's a really important part of, of the experience. So uh, next question is, uh, if you find a child has difficulty in one area, how do you help them outside of the classroom? And so, um, you know, if we want to start, you know, Emily or Trish, you know, how that works, or Cindy, how that works on the primary and lower school side. Well, I can share that we really emphasize that a great deal in New Avenues, because sometimes the journey to get to our program has been a difficult one, and children, they don't always believe in themselves. And so we really work on you know, in our morning meetings, we find out what's happening outside of school. We talk about everybody's different strengths and how you're different in that you're good at that. Well, can you help the other person do that? And really to let the children see that it's not just being valued on how you read or how you write or how you do math, but everything is important. Uh, and we take those and then share those stories, you know, as Trish shared, they share their stories, they go home, the families come back, and we really work to keep that line open because it's important to build the child all the way so that they don't worry about the areas that are challenging. And I'd say, you know, if, and for children who need some extra support, we have lots in place. Mm -hmm. So we have, um, our teachers are incredibly dedicated to the learning of their students. And so our teachers at every division are willing to stay after school or come before school or work at recess or lunch to help children um, and give them a little extra boost in areas that they need to. It's not at all unusual to hear an upper school student say, hey, I'm going over or, you know, I'm going to, to meet with a teacher today to get a little extra help. Same thing in the lower school. Um, we have teachers um, that meet with children regularly just to give a little boost. In addition, we have a really um, a really substantial learning support team at every division that can provide outside tutoring um, outside of the classroom or even pull out um, from the classrooms. So there is support available in all different areas, um, depending on the level of need, really. Yep, and I'm, I'm piggybacking again, here I go, right on um, what Trish had to say. Um, the learning support is fantastic, but also the social emotional support too. All of our divisions have counselors. And so, you know, we realize that kids um, express themselves differently and sometimes need a little bit of extra support in those areas, not only just in the academics, but also in the social aspect of it. And, you know, having a counselor in each division is incredible and a rarity, to be honest. Um, so the primary school has that as well. And, you know, we're not provide, we're not tutoring three-year-olds um, in our division, but we are providing support where needed. And we're very lucky to have two teachers in every classroom. And so it allows us to differentiate where those kids that are needing um, a push to excel in certain areas and those that are needing those reteach moments, we have the support staff within our building to provide that to all of our kids. And that even goes to on the playground. You know, we've got kids, it is very important to learn how to swing, to pump your legs on the playground and to have teachers out there providing support and having kids out there showing and modeling <laughs> each other. It is, it's huge. It's huge. Just wait, Mr. Dawson. Wait. Oh, trust me. I've seen him on a swing. It's not pretty. Yeah. We have support for that. Thank you. 
Um, all right. And, and Ira, maybe what we'll do is, is to talk about the middle and upper school side. Well, let's, let's, uh, we'll join it with this next question as well, since it's middle and upper school focused on learning support. Um, so uh, can you talk about the learning support program in the middle and upper school, uh, yeah. particularly for students with ADHD who need executive functioning um, help and development? So Ira, if you want to yeah. take that on the middle school side, and I'll talk about it on the upper school side. Yeah, one thing I'm really proud about is is the learning support program in the middle school is that it it doesn't focus on just those who have uh, evaluations, but also it focuses on anybody who needs any type of support within the classroom. What we know is that sometimes we will receive students who may not have noticed that they needed uh, they had a learning difference or they needed some support, and so our job is to really, really as teachers hone in on that and to make sure that uh, we can help support them in any and every way. One, some ways that we do so is that, of course, just like Mr. Arjona said, is that we have a study hall built into their schedule. And so the study halls are, I would say, uh, 10 to 1 teacher rate, student ratio. And that teacher can really help that student uh, navigate the walk of web in which we use, uh, utilize to communicate with our families and our students, to help organize their planners, to set a calendar, uh, to, to plan their, their events through their calendar to see what expectations the teachers uh, would like to uh, have them meet. Uh, a lot of our students utilize their advisor and their study hall teacher to ask questions like, hey, I wanna email my teacher and ask questions, but I don't know how to say it. Can you help me kind of form this question? I, I write this email to, to my teacher and they can do so. Uh, another great thing is that, you know, it, we, we do some really different kind of scenarios. For example, we have Backpack Club where students can meet with uh, uh, one of our English teachers and our learn support specialists after school and before school just to sit in their vicinity. And if they have questions and need support, they can receive that. We have our Applied Strategies courses, which focuses on executive functioning, where students can come in and learn about um, how to really plan out their day so that they're very effective, how to... Um, work backwards from a test state and realize how they need to plan uh, their week to be in order to be prepared for the test, but also how not to stuff pages into the book and actually put it into a folder, <laughs> put some holes in it, and then actually create an organized system that works for them. And so we try our best to meet every learner where they are because we realize that we have uh, students that have so many different learning styles and we wanna be able to meet them where they are and support them in every, every way. Uh, I think the best thing that we do that helps support students from a learning support standpoint is we partner with the families. And anytime uh, there's a situation that we need to bring to the family's attention, not only do we show and bring to light, but also we partner with them to create a plan of action. You know, the good thing about it is as they get older, it's, it's no longer um, just mom telling them what to do. That student has to come to the table with a plan of action because we want them to have ownership of the process as well. Great. And, and just to build off of what I, Ira said, I think he, you know, covered a lot of the bases there. I touched upon the direct study halls that we have um, within the upper school and also our full-time learning specialist, Karen Wicken, who works with a lot of students during that study hall period. It gives the students flexibility within their day to, to work with uh, Karen Wicken. And she works with a lot of students that on those executive functioning skills. Um, and her focus is on helping the students be advocates for themselves and building the skills, not functioning for those students, but instead providing them with consistent support so that they build the skills over time. And, you know, it doesn't happen after one meeting. It doesn't, you know, happen after two, but over time with them working with her and building the skills to where they can then look back and see the growth that they've had in, you know, managing their schoolwork and on, on building their skills over time. Um, the next question is a little, uh, also an upper school focus one. It says, can you speak to the college placement process? Uh, when does it begin? So really that's, uh, you know, within the, the upper school, especially within ninth grade, um, it starts at that point. Um, and, but really it is a, a scaffolded process. So at the beginning, their focus of the college office is talking with the students. They have a session with the freshmen early on in the school year. They have a session, a session for ninth grade parents as well, 
where the focus is on just exploring what's out there, understanding a little bit about what the college process is, um, doing some, some work on just getting a sense of, of the range of colleges out there. Because most students, when they're in ninth grade, they know where their parents went to college. They might know what colleges they're seeing on you know, TV for football and basketball, but there's just a whole range of, of college environments out there for students. And, and really the focus is on exploration. Um, then as, you know, so they work with the students uh, a little bit more each year. And then by junior year, they're having individual meetings to develop a plan and working with the students, um, especially at the end of their junior year and in, heading into the senior year on that application process. Um, you know, they have programs on financial aid and understanding how to afford college, um, you know, programs where we have uh, admissions deans that you know, participate in the program and speak to our, our uh, families as well. So it's one where the focus is on providing information to families, helping families wade through all of that information, and then developing a plan that's unique to those uh, students. Starting in ninth grade, but in a way that's appropriate and, and you know, uh, informs without building that pressure. Um, next question, what does the financial aid process look like at Walker? And, and uh, Jack, if you want to Take this one. Sure. Um, you know, I guess uh, one of the things I would say is that it's 100% need based. Um, there are no scholarships at all. It's all financial assistance that's based on uh, an individual's family's need. And and the second thing, and probably equally important, it, that I would say is the process is completely confidential. Uh, there's actually only two people in our school community that know, uh, other than the family, that know who's on financial aid. I actually don't know any of the students who are on financial aid. None of our board members know who's on financial aid. Michael, Ira, Trish, Emily, we, none of us know who's on financial aid. That's a completely confidential process, um, and it's totally based on finan financial need. And um, historically, prior to the pandemic, uh, about one in five students at Walker received some sort of financial aid. And I think some of the smaller financial aid grants would be in the $2,000 range. Um, but the average grant at Walker tends to be about $11,500. Um, and so, you know, the pre previous five years, about one in five students received financial aid. In this pandemic year, uh, we actually have one in four students that are receiving financial aid, the, the literal percentage is 27%, uh, which is the exact same number as it is for our entire National Association of Independent Schools. Um, and, and we dedicate uh, about 9.4% uh, of our operating budget to financial aid, which is, um, you know, sort of by context, the average for independent schools uh, for our National Association is 14%. So, we're making our budget go farther and, and still reaching the same percentage of students as our peer schools. Um, and that's a very individual uh, and confidential uh, conversation uh, that we have with families that have need because we want the school to be accessible from a socioeconomic standpoint. All right, excellent. Thank you, Thank you Jack. Um, so we'll close with this question and then I'll turn it over to Jack to close this out. Appreciate all the questions that have come in. It's really robust set of questions that cover a lot of different topics and we really uh, appreciate all of those. So the last question, um, we'll go to Dr. Tyson. Uh, it's a specific question about primary school, um, you know, but if, if others wanna chime in on, on this same idea, um, if a student, if a child transitions in the middle of the year, um, is there a support system for that transition, a buddy system, teacher connection or conferences? What, what is that like when it's a, a, a middle of the year transition? Absolutely. Um, so there's always a support system in play, um, whether you arrive on the first day or the 50th day or the 90th day. Um, our teachers, we're very blessed to have a, a small building where we have, like I said before, two teachers in every classroom, our own primary school counselor. And in our building, it is all hands on deck all the time. So providing support is one of the things we do best. And, you know, when kids transition in, some are, like I said, some are ready to go and are, especially after this pandemic, are ready to be around other children. 
outside of their family. And some are very hesitant because they've been around their family and only their family for so long. So when they come in, we meet each and every child exactly where they are. And um, if that child needs extra support emotionally, our counselor spends extra time pushing into the classroom. It might look like a one-on-one -on -one session or a small group. We realize that kids at this age are, you know, want to make friends, of course, Half of our children in the beginning of the year don't even pay attention to the children's names. They just know that you like to swing, I like to swing, let's go swing, and um, and they're off. So, you know, really introducing the kids to each other through morning meetings and allowing them to get to know the other students in their class. Our kids are very excited to welcome new friends um, at all times. They, they think it's just awesome when new people come into our um our building or our classrooms. So there is a continuous support system put in play, whether it's academic. We don't really have buddy systems because we're all your buddy um, and we're all in it together. So, you know, between having our counselors and our teachers checking in periodically and just providing extra support and those morning meetings are just a great time for our, our kids to transition in. I will also say that not only is the child transitioning into the school, the family is yeah. also. And so we pay a lot of attention to making sure the transition for families is smooth, making sure you're up to date on receiving all of our communications because we send we send a good amount. And um, so we wanna make sure you're getting all of that. And you know, your carpool number, by week, like day three, we'll know what carpool number you are and what car you drive and whether you made pancakes for breakfast and how that impacted your child's day. So um, it's just it's, it's great and we welcome new friends all the time. All right, excellent, thank you. So I know we said those last question. I'm gonna sneak one more in because we had one more come in. So, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I'll, I don't wanna get in trouble, but I'll, I'll sneak this last one in. So is there a supportive environment for students of faith, uh, clubs, et cetera? Um, I think that's a, a, a great question. Within our upper school, um, we do have uh, clubs that are geared around, that are faith-based clubs. We have a, a robust fellowship of Christian students, um, as well as a Hillel club. Um, and that's an important part of the, the student experience as well. They all, you know, we were talking about the students sharing holiday traditions and the uh, FCS and Hillel both contributed to our holiday assembly we had on on Friday as well with with a, a you know a big part of the program. So that's certainly you know a, a part of the student experience and 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 one of the things that's notable about those clubs that you'll hear both of them say right off is it's not just for students that are of that faith. They want to be welcoming to for other students to come in that want to learn. Um, you know. A, a, of any of those particular faiths as well. So that is definitely a part of the experience. Yeah, um, we, have, we have Young Republicans Club, Young Democrats Club, you know. We do. I, I'll I mean, if somebody there's... wanted to start a Young Libertarians Club, I mean, it takes, you know, it takes two students to find a sponsor and they can make yeah. that happen. Absolutely. And, and that I think is an important feature is that, you know, it, it's the, the clubs are, are student based. So it's an environment where we want our students to explore different aspects of affinity they have with other other classmates and to explore all these different topics. And um, every you know robust club that we have started from a group of students. Yep. And a faculty member sponsor that then, you know, grew the, the club into, you know, a really big part of our student life. So every year when we publish our student life list that has a list of clubs, it's it's going to be different. We have different things that are added every year. And that's a really, you know, great part of the program. Yeah. So, Jack, I'll turn it over to you and uh, to to close us out. Sure. So th thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I know some of you. <laughs> you know, wanted to hear more literally about the value of a Walker education. You're thinking like, Jack, what is the return on my investment? Uh, and so I want to close out on that um, in some ways. And uh, and I also, I don't want to answer all your questions because I want you to keep, keep coming back and keep learning more about the school and keep asking those questions. That's part of who we are and part of, I mean, we encourage our students to ask questions all the time. I, I had a, a really unique question that I won't tell you that I Kindergartner asked me yesterday, I can't say it in public, but no, Emily's getting nervous over there, but we do <laughs> encourage our kids to ask questions and he asked a doozy. Um, but I want to close the conversation with a compelling, tangible example of the value uh, and the return on the investment at Walker. And 
you know, earlier we talked about the willingness of our students to challenge themselves by taking advanced placement courses um, at such a high level. And because that happens in collaboration with really terrific teachers, our students succeed on those AP exams in a way that gives them actual college credit. So much so that many of our alumni enter into college as second semester freshmen or even as sophomores from the standpoint of credit. Uh, this was the case with my own daughter who entered college as a second semester freshman. And while the gra college graduation rates, whenever you hear about college graduation rates on the news or reading in a magazine or seeing online or whatever, uh, those benchmarks are all based on students graduating from college in six years, not four years, six years. So any public college graduation rate you see is based on students graduating in six years. Well, our expectation is that our alumni will graduate in four years or less thanks to all the college credit they received for courses they took at Walker. And this varies, obviously, depending on students. I mean, we have some that take an extraordinary number, like 10 or 12, and then we have some that'll take one or two. Uh, it just depends. But when you consider that the class of 2020 received $7 million in merit aid for college, not including the Hope Scholarship, not including the Zell Miller Scholarship, your investment in a Walker education pays off in more ways than you can imagine. And our students, and speaking of the Hope or the Zell Miller, our students go off to college exceedingly well prepared and they keep the Hope and Zell Miller at a pretty substantial rate. I mean, we did a survey of our alumni from the classes of 2014 through 2018, just this past year. And 88% of them responded that they were more or far more prepared than their college classmates. And that, that's coming directly from our, from our alumni. So we really do think that in, you know, when you think about the credit they earn from taking those AP courses, plus the merit that they earn for college, the investment pays off significantly. So I wanna thank you for joining us tonight for Warm Up to Walker. Um, thank you for your time, for your attention, really good questions. And um, we certainly, as I said, we, do, we don't want to answer all your questions tonight because we want you to keep learning about Walker and getting to know us as you look at the best fit for your child, children, uh, your family. And we hope that you'll find Walker to be, in fact, that best fit for your family. So take care and uh, enjoy the holidays. Uh, if you're like us, I know you're looking forward to a little downtime. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you in 2021 in the new year. Thank you.